school on cosmology. And the team of this school uh, is, is challenges for the standard cosmological model. So uh, uh, we, we wanted this uh, school, of course, to, to be uh, in person. And uh, as you all know, and this is not possible at the moment. Actually, I do hope you are all healthy and safe. So we had to go with this uh, online uh, format. And this online format has advantages and disadvantages. Of course, one of the main disadvantages is that you guys are not here, so we cannot have you know, more interactions, go out, have a caipirinha, discuss physics over caipirinhas. And I hope you can come some other time when the, uh, the situation in the world becomes more stable again. And uh, on the other hand, we are able to um, reach out for a much larger amount of uh, participants. In fact, we uh, had a record, I think, uh, registration uh, of participants. So we have uh, people from all over the world attending this school, and this is really incredible. Uh, so people that could not otherwise attend uh, this event if it were held in person here in Brazil, can, uh, can join uh, online. So we're very uh, excited about this, uh, this event and uh, I, we do hope uh, you guys are going to profit from it. So I, I, I just want to give you a few announcements and uh, before we start, so we're going to start at uh, 10 a.m. Um, so the, uh, uh, if you have any problems with uh, IT, the person to contact uh, is Tiago Codinotto, and this is uh, his email. And he is also here uh, in this uh, Zoom meeting. Okay, so let's uh, move. So of course, some uh, uh, etiquette that by now you are all used to it after all these uh, Zoom meetings. So please uh, mute your microphone and turn off your video when you enter the room because this will help to reduce the total bandwidth and avoid interference. If you do not want to do this, if you not do this, uh, we are going to do it for you. <laughs> so only the speakers and organizers should have their video on. So each lecture, as, as this is a online school, we want to make it light. So each lecture will be uh, 60 minutes long. And the, lecture, the lecturer um, will pause and ask for questions uh, during the lecture. And there, there's going to be a chairperson who will coordinate the questions. So each uh, lecture, each session, there will be a chairperson. So at the end of the lectures, we hope to have some more time for not too many questions, a few questions. Uh, however, and this is very important, we're going to have a whole hour for more questions, for discussing the lectures and also the, uh, the problem sets. So, um, so please, uh, if you cannot ask the questions uh, that you have at the end of each lecture, please write them down and ask them during the Q&A sessions. You can also, uh, I'm going to talk about the Slack channel that uh, some of you already know. You can also write questions in the Slack channel. And that's nice because it's, uh, it's registered. So if you want to ask a question, there are three possible options. So you can raise your hand using the option in the participant list on the bottom of the screen of your Zoom uh, room. And then when the chairperson calls your name, then you unmute your microphone and you ask the question. It may be also useful to type your question in the chat so that everybody can see it. And then maybe someone in the chat will even answer your question. So if your question is answered before your name is called, please do not forget to lower your hand. Okay. You can also wait until the lecture is over and ask the lecturer either during the question period or in the private after the question period has finished, or just ask directly. Um, but again, I encourage you to keep questions also for the uh, question and answer sessions and also to use the Slack channel that I mentioned uh, uh, shortly. 
So there's ch the chat uh, uh, tool in the Zoom, but please use chat only for the following reasons. So if you have a physics questions, a physics question that others may be able to answer, and in this case, you can send a message to everybody. If you have a computer problem, in this case, you send your message privately to the co-host uh, Tiago Codinotto. And if you have a question about the organization of the workshop, in this case, you can send your message privately to the organizer, who is also a co-host. And the files of the lecture, containing the lectures and exercises uh, will be available on the site. So I, I understand that some lecturers are going to use uh, iPads to write the lecture uh, as, they, as they teach the lecture. And these files will also be available on site afterwards. Okay, so we also have an attendance sheet uh, in Google Docs uh, with a link that we make available every day. This is only for us organizers to have an idea of people that are attending um, this meeting. I already put the link in the Slack channel um, that some of you already assessed. Now, uh, concerning attendance certificates, they will be given on demand to students that try to solve at least 70% of the exercises of the school and send them to uh, Tiago Codino. Um, OK. And as I mentioned already several times, and there's also a link uh, uh, from the page of the school, there's a Slack channel that was created to discuss lectures and exercises about the school. And, and, and so this is the link, but you can also access it from, um, from, the, um, from the web page. So we have a really um, exciting program. And I do hope, again, uh, all the organizers hope that you guys have a very productive two weeks in this school. We have a really uh, stellar set of lecturers, and I'm sure you will um, uh, enjoy it uh, a lot. OK, this is all I have to say. So we're going to start in five minutes. So we have time for uh, Fabian Schmidt to see if he can uh, share his screen. Let me stop sharing my screen. So Fabian is already online. And uh, so Fab Fabian, are you a co-host? Oh, no, I, I have to make a co-host. Just one second. No, you are a co-host already, no? I cannot share, it says. OK, I make a co-host. So now, now you can uh, share. And before, before we start, uh, I want just to say a few words about uh, Fabian. So, um, so Schmidt, um, he is a uh, permanent scientific staff at the Max Planck Institute for um, Astrophysics in Munich. And, and he did his PhD at the University of Chicago then he was a Moore Fellow at Caltech and an Einstein Fellow at Princeton University before joining uh, the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. And, and Fabian is uh, the co-author, as, as you can see here, <laughs> of the second edition of uh, one of the, uh, maybe the best book these days on cosmology, modern cosmology with Scott Dudleson. And he's an uh, expert in, in many different fields in cosmology and large scale structure, and num okay, you, you, you hear from his lecture. He's really a fantastic uh, uh, lecturer and uh, a person that is, uh, I would say, one of the most influential cosmologists this day. So if you want to see what the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the cutting edge of uh, structure formation, uh, you should look at papers of Fabian, okay? So uh, we still have a, a few minutes, but uh, I think, maybe if you don't mind, we can, we can start. I don't think uh, we should wait uh, three minutes. So why don't you go ahead and uh, start? I'll be the chair of this uh, lecture 
this first lecture, okay? So Fagan, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to give these lectures and, and go ahead. Uh, thanks, Rogerio, for the very flattering introduction. Um, so I should say that I'm really not used to teaching online, so I hope this will go well. I much prefer a blackboard, but I mean, this is what we all have to live with, but then many more of you could attend, so that's a good thing too. Um, regarding the exercises, so uh, I just learned there's a requirement of solving 70% to get a certificate. Now, I actually, for now, posted a lot of exercises, mostly from the book. Um, I think 70% of those would be too much to ask. So we'll, we'll figure this out, um, what the requirement should be. Right? Um, yeah, actually, if you, I, I was careful to say that 70% of problems people should try to solve. <laughs> OK, <laughs> right. Um, Okay, but we can definitely discuss this uh, offline. Um, but just want to uh, say that we're, we're going to figure this out precisely. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so what's the motivation for looking at structure formation and large scale structure? Um, so, large scale structure, I really mean the distribution of matter and galaxies in our universe on scales that are much larger than galaxies themselves. Um, and it's interesting to note that, um, I'm sorry about this cursor. Uh, again, I'm... Let's see. No, that's not a good one. Okay, maybe. This is, all right, we'll live with that. Um, so, right, so uh, what can we learn from large scale structure? Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, there was already strong evidence in large scale structure for a cosmological constant or a dark energy from large scale structure in combination with what was little, the little that was known from the CMB back then. So, um, you know, large scale structure has a strong history of, uh, telling us about cosmology. And now what's so exciting about it is, or one of the things that's so exciting is that we have so many large experiments um, um, focusing on, on large scale structure and delivering really an unprecedented amount of data. And what maybe is the most important thing to, to, to know, think about for large scale structure in terms of cosmology is that it's really a three-dimensional probe, right? So as we observe galaxies in the distant galaxies, right? We look back in time. So the further we select our galaxies, the older they are and the earlier the universe is that they probe. And so you, I'm sure many of you have seen the sketch of the expanding universe where the size of this tube is supposed to indicate the uh, approximate radius of the universe. Um, the universe started in a tiny um, size, relatively speaking, as a big bang. Then there was the epoch of inflation of which we will hear um, in Valerie's lectures. Um, and after a while, uh, the radiation decoupled from ordinary matter and the universe became transparent. And that's when the CMB was admitted the cosmic microwave background, but the cosmic microwave background really comes from a single epoch, right? So uh, it allows us to measure this time slice of the universe, large scale structure, we're really attempting to map out the entire past history since then, including this epoch of accelerated expansion very recently. Um, so more precisely, what will large scale structure tell us? Well, we can actually try to uh, constrain this epoch inflation, in particular, reconstruct the properties of these initial conditions that inflation generated, the initial seed fluctuations. Um, and we can study dark energy and gravity. And just as an example of how this works, I pasted here the equation governing growth of structure on very large linear scales. We'll get to learn what that means later. And you can see that this growth depends, it's a differential equation, an ordinary differential equation, and it depends 
on the Hubble rate, which uh, depends in turn on what stuff there is in the universe, the properties of dark energy, but it also uh, Newton's constant appears. So it also depends on gravity, right? So basically our goal is to constrain both of these with the growth of structure. And then finally, um, we can learn about dark matter, um, in particular, how cold it actually is and what is the sum of neutrino masses. You know, you could think of neutrino as part of dark matter because essentially it doesn't interact with light. Um, so I'm gonna try to address how we probe all of these things um, uh, during the course of these lectures. So the main challenge, unlike the cosmic microwave background, is that the data we collect looks like this, right? It's clearly, I mean, it's stunningly beautiful, but also very complex. So every photon that we observe from galaxies is the result of a very complex nonlinear process, right? Because you need stars to form and star formation is incredibly complicated. And then you need a lot of stars to make up an observable galaxy and all this stuff. So we, we don't have any single uh, simple uh, probe. But the amazing thing about large constructor is that we can still get information out of that by trying to really deal with these, um, trying to really um, you know, marginalize out all these uh, uncertainties, uh, all these complex processes. Whereas in the CMB, we're really observing uh, photons that come from a almost perfect um, uh, Bose-Einstein distribution. So equilibrium distribution with small perturbations, right? So this is really uh, um, a problem that is completely solvable. And we'll hear more about this in Yassine's lectures. Um, Fascinating. Um, yeah, so the data that we are interested in, though, looks a little bit more like this. So what we do is we, um, we observe a lot of galaxies. We survey a giant part of the sky, catalog their positions and redshifts, and then we place galaxies on a map, right? Because the redshift and the position allows us to get an idea of their three-dimensional position. And so we can make a catalog and we can um, construct a three-dimensional map. And so this is something that already looks a little closer to the CMB maps. And this is something, this is basically our underlying data set. So um, on to some preliminaries. So um, for the most part, I will be assuming the simplest vanilla um, cosmology in the context of the standard cosmological model, which means Euclidean, so spatially flat, lambda CDM cosmology with Gaussian adiabatic and almost scale initial perturbations. Um, we'll learn about what those words mean. Um, and also a dark energy of, with equation of state W equals minus one, which is equivalent to saying there's a cosmological constant. Lambda. Um, the results, a lot of the results hold for a general smooth dark energy with W unequal to lambda two. So it's uh, unequal to minus one, two. So it's not really as restrictive. Um, and then I'll also neglect massive neutrinos because they do make things quite a bit more complicated. So hopefully we'll get to generalizing these things um, near the end of the lectures. So how do we go about studying or you know, developing a theory for structure in the universe? Um, so first of all, let's take, into, take account of what relevant ingredients are. So first of all, we have all the stuff in the universe. Um, we have electrons and nuclei, which we combine together as baryons. We never really need to consider them separately because they're so closely tied to each other. Then we have photons, radiation. Most of the photons are actually from the cosmic microwave background. And then we have dark matter. We also know that there are neutrinos because uh, of the nuclear reactions that happened in the early universe. We know there's a background of neutrinos and we also know there's dark energy. So that's really our minimal 
budget of the universe. And all of these act, uh, interact gravitationally, right? That gravity is universal, so it acts on all of these. Now, um, first of all, for dark energy, we'll neglect any perturbations in a dark energy. So then um, the, uh, we, basically the effect of gravity is, is negligible apart from the background. And um, yeah, so that's the first assumption we make. And then non-gravitational interactions, of course, we should also think about, but fortunately they'll be small for the most part in what I discuss. So then basically we're dealing with gravity on the one side, coupling everything together and matter on the other side. And in order to describe matter, we use statistical physics because in cosmology, and we don't care about the fate of individual particles, right? We only care about uh, their statistical overall evolution and the relevant equations for that are the Boltzmann equations. I think there is a question. Okay, but I'm not the moderator, so I'll continue. Um, right, yeah, you can so, okay. so if maybe Raj wants to ask the question, Raj. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. And I'm from India. My name, is, my name is Miraj. Sir, I want to ask the question. Can I proceed? Yeah. Uh, sir, in the uh, on the picture of dark energy through gravity interaction, why this is written is no perturbations? Well, this is so basically, if dark energy is a cosmological constant, then there are no perturbations. It's just a constant, right? And if dark energy is something more general, then there will be perturbations, absolutely. But there, the effect of these perturbations is relatively small because, uh, first of all, dark energy becomes relevant only recently. And secondly, because we already know its equation of state is close to minus one. So perturbations have to be small. So this is actually an excellent approximation, but it is certainly possible to go beyond that. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There's one more related uh, question. If you don't In the mind. chat, yes, I see the chat. Um, so this was just referring to the fact that we will be interesting in perturbations here. And so a smooth dark energy affects the background expansion of the universe, but not the, you know, uh, we don't have to take into account its density perturbations. That's all I was saying. So maybe, um, yeah, I think at this point, my, I've been a little confusing. So, um, yeah, so in, in structure formation is about, um, I'm most going to focus about the later universe, so after the time when the CMB was emitted. And at that point, photons make up a tiny fraction of the energy budget, and so we can completely neglect them. And also the Compton scattering between photons and electrons becomes negligible, and we can neglect it. And so then we're really with this dealing with the system of dark matter and baryons coupled together by gravity. Okay, so um, let's move on. Um, so bar we're gonna deal with baryons and CDM. And one of the defining properties of these is that they're cold. So the particles themselves move non-relativistically. Um, that's the first very important fact. And the second important fact we'll use is that structure formation happens mostly on scales that are much smaller than the present Hubble horizon. So that means we can use the subhorizon approximation. And both of these really simplify the equations a lot. And they also allow us to get more physical intuition because on subhorizon scales, um, so relatively small scales, and when you're dealing with non-relativistic particles, a lot of the intuition for Newtonian gravity really still applies. Um, right, I will not cover here the evolution of perturbations or of structure in the early universe. So before um, recombination, before the CMB was emitted, I just want to say a few words because these, this evolution of course, provides the initial condition for the structure evolution we solve later, right? 
So we do need to know the initial conditions to put into our structural formation equations. And so uh, just very roughly, um, very roughly and quickly, what happens to the evolution of structure in the early universe? So basically, um, if you consider a perturbation of a given wavelength, that wavelength gets stretched out as the universe expands. Um, but the horizon of the universe, um, the scales that are within causal contact also grow. And so what happens is that a given perturbation what enters the horizon, that's a technical term we use, so it becomes, it enter, uh, you know, it becomes visible for a given observer as being, you know, um, describing the causally connected region. And so basically, this is an important epoch in the physical evolution of every mode. As soon as it enters the horizon, it starts to grow if gravity is strong enough to make it grow, right? And so this plot shows the evolution of density perturbations of different wavelengths at early times. And if you look at the mode with the highest wave number, so smallest wavelength, that enters the horizon earliest and starts to grow. And so it has more time to grow than smaller scale modes, uh, sorry, larger scale modes with smaller wave number that enter the horizon later, right? And one important thing uh, one important epoch in the early universe was when it transitioned from radiation domination to matter domination. And so depending on whether mode entered early enough to be still in radiation domination or later when it entered in matter domination, that changes its evolution. And so that will lead to a characteristic imprint in the statistics of the field we'll see later. So I will, I'm not describing this. I just want to sort of set a little bit the stage for the effects we'll see later. Um, so the Hubble horizon is the size of a cause, roughly speaking, the size of a causally connected region. And if you have the Hubble rate, H of A or H of T at a given time, you can compute it as the speed of light over um, this, uh, this Hubble rate, C over H. And our lectures, um, will uh, set speed of light to one, so it's just one over H. But this is precisely, yeah, we're not gonna need that stuff for the lectures at all because we're really gonna talk about things inside the horizon. Here's just notation is for reference when, when you look at the slides later. Um, I will explain the symbols as I come across. So um, how does structure formation um, then proceed? So I'm gonna give a brief overview just again to kind of set the stage and we'll quantify and explain all these things as we go on later. So if it doesn't make sense immediately, you know, don't worry, it's, we'll cover it later. So basic fact of the universe, of our universe is that large scale fluctuations are small where small scale fluctuations are fairly large. And partially this is, or mostly this is because small scale fluctuations had more time to grow. And so what happens is that structure formation, you know, small scale structures with largest perturbations grow fastest and assemble to gravitationally bound structures. And then that's, um, Formation, uh, process of forming bound structures continues to larger and larger scales. And when you go to the very largest scales, there's actually no bound structures at all yet. Um, those are still small density perturbations on a background. So if you look at this plot, this shows uh, the matter density in a full end body simulation. A slice through the mat, so it's a slice through the three dimensional matter distribution in logarithmic scale. And so you can see um, a lot of structures, of course. You can see in particular filaments and nodes and big empty regions. And all this stuff is just a consequence of gravitational evolution. But you can also see by eye that there are no significant large scale density fluctuations, right? If you imagine dividing this slice into four quadrants, right? And then just 
by I computing the mean density in each quadrant, they're about the same, right? I mean, there's no big, big difference in the mean density in this patch than, than here. And that's precisely this, uh, this statement. Large scale fluctuations are small. And that allows us also to do faithful simulations of large volumes, because then we can assume that the entire simulation volume is basically at the background level. Now, if we zoom in, right, this was a very coarse resolution view I showed before. Now we can zoom in and you see that the structure is amazingly complex, right? So if I zoom in on one of these nodes between that form between the intersection of different filaments, you can see that this is a very complex structure made out of a lot of substructures and those substructures in turn have substructures and so on. It's a whole hierarchy of, of structures. And these bound substructures we call halos for historical reasons. And we'll get to, that, we'll get to halos in, in later lectures. So then um, another key aspect is I mean, one thing is predicting something like this, the density field uh, of large scale structure. The other thing is how do we compare this with data? So we don't, we can't say in the real universe, um, like I expect I can predict there will be a galaxy at this particular location or a galaxy cluster. We cannot do that because we don't know the initial conditions of the universe. The only statements we can make are statistical statements. What about what's the, statistical properties of the observed matter distribution, and does that confirm with my theory predictions? So what we do then first is decompose every quantity into a background and fluctuations. So example, for example, for the matter density, rho of x, we um, Describe this in terms of the fractional matter density perturbations, just for convenience, take out the cosmological mean, which we know how it evolves, um, and just study for fluctuations. And then we, um, what we, our tools that we can use are that we know the st statistics of the initial conditions. We don't know what the initial conditions were precisely, but we know their statistics in the context of a given model, say from inflation. And we know how a given initial condition evolves into the final density field, right? That's what gravity and the Boltzmann equations predict. So in summary, we're always dealing with statistical fields. And then of course, the question is how do we characterize a statistical field such as the fractional matter density perturbation, delta of x. Um, okay. So so in general, this is a, a very complicated field, um, statistical fields. You know, it has strong connections with quantum field theory. So if you have a background in that, it will probably sound familiar, but if you don't, don't worry. Let's just consider the simplest possible field, right? What could be the simplest possible statistical field? Well, um, simplest I can think of is that all the different points um, you know, of the field are statistically independent and they're simply Gaussian random variables with vanishing mean. Okay, so I basically just have a set of um, Gaussian random variables or a set of harmonic oscillators, if you want. And cosmology, actually that's very common. That is our basic statistical field that we we start with, in most cases, with just one complication. So the, this description, independent Gaussian random variables at each point applies in Fourier space, not in real space. Okay, so think of the density field at fixed time, three-dimensional field, you Fourier transform it to get delta of K as a function of 3D wave number. And now that field has a, the simplest possible description. All the Fourier modes are independent Gaussian random variables with a vanishing mean. Okay, and then we just need, the only thing we need to describe them is what the variance is of each mode as a function of K. 
and we call that the power spectrum p of k so uh, to put it in a technical language the correlator the ensemble average of two fields delta of k delta uh, the complex conjugate here to make it a real quantity delta star of k prime is proportional to a direct delta because different po uh, points of Fourier space are independent times the power spectrum okay and this caps encapsulates the entire information about the field as long as it's what we call gaussian Okay, so this is the definition of what we call a Gaussian field in cosmology. Good. So we'll deal a lot with these power spectra because they're, um, again, the main statistics that is um, uh, that describes the field. So um, let's, I mean, the power spectrum is something that is obviously not very intuitive. So let's uh, try to go a bit further and try to characterize the large scale matter density field using something that maybe is more intuitive and that makes a better connection to the plot I showed earlier of the simulation slice, right? And that plot, I, sh I, I said that this shows there's large scale density fluctuations are small. So let's make this quantitative. So I'm interested in now, and what I want to do is I want to smooth the matter density field on different scales and then compute the variance of that smooth density field, right? So given a smoothing scale, then that's just one number. That's nice, right? I can make sense of a single number. So um, the variance of the field is just the smooth field, the ensemble average of the smooth field squared. And now I know I have a Gaussian field. So I use the fact that its Fourier space properties are simple, right? I do the double Fourier transform. Um, so integral over D3K uh, with the e to the i k dot x and minus k prime dot x because this is the complex conjugate field, right? And now I have the ensemble average of this. Uh, quantity, which I just showed, right, is just collapses to a direct delta. So I end up with um, an inter a single integral over the power spectrum times uh, the smoothing kernel in Fourier space squared, right? Uh, a, a, a smoothing operation in real space just turns into a product in, in Fourier space. So that is another reason that makes it simple. So um, so that's simple enough. Given a smoothing kernel, for example, a Gaussian, um, I can uh, compute what the variance is as a function of the smoothing scale. And this is shown here. So the, um, the y-axis shows the standard deviation and the x-axis shows the length scale of the filter. And um, okay, I'm not showing a Gaussian, actually I'm showing a real space top hat filter. It doesn't really matter um, what the filter is. The shape of this curve will always be the same. And what is the shape? Well, the standard deviation is large on small scales and small on large scales, which is precisely what we said um, before, right? And so this is, I'm using here the power spectrum that we'll discuss later, but this already um, shows the validity of the statement I made er earlier and that one could see by eye. And now an important scale on this plot is where this standard deviation becomes of order one. Okay, so this is roughly a 10 megaparsec, h to the minus one megaparsec, cosmologists favorite units, um, right? So this scale, what does what's the significance of this scale? This means that on length scales of 10 megaparsec, my density field is typically has order unity fluctuations. So for sure, if I do anything that is a perturbation theory in small fluctuations, that will not work on scales like this, 10 megaparsec and smaller, right? I will have to restrict myself to larger scales. But if I go to scales of, of um, you know, close to 100 megaparsec, then the standard deviation the typical density fluctuations are small, and on these scales, I can do uh, 
I can expand in small fluctuations. Finally, uh, another important um, um, another important um, point is is gravitational potentials. Okay, so here I'm showing, and the red dashed lines shows the um, the red dashed line shows the um, standard deviation of gravitational potentials multiplied by 10,000, okay? And so you can see that the gravitational potentials are always small. Doesn't matter which scale, right? I mean, here, it, it looks like they're larger than the density fluctuates, but keep in mind, there's a factor of 10,000 here. So it's actually way, way lower, right? And what that means is that um, for those of you who are more um, technically inclined and more uh, more background in general relativity, it means that the metric perturbations are small. And that means that uh, this small perturbations to a background Friedman Robertson Walker metric is a good approximation on all scales and structure formation. Okay, we do not have to run numerical relativity simulations, we can run um, quasi Newtonian simulations with small perturbations. Uh, yeah, so why um, the question, why the variance uh, decreases when the smoothing scale increases? So this I mentioned is the fundamental property of our universe. And in the end, it goes back to the fact that small scale modes have more time to grow since they entered the horizon of the early universe than large scale modes. Okay, that coupled with the, the fact that inflation generates scale invariant perturbations implies this. I know it's a lot to digest. So um, unfortunately, if at this point, I can just say you have to accept that, that our universe looks like that. Okay, small scales have larger fluctuations than large scales. But for us as theorists, um, or in general for anyone, wants to do precision cosmology, it's a, it's a huge advantage to be able to work with small fluctuations on large scales. So then, um, right, we're talking about statistics. So um, the goal in a lot of my lectures will be to compute the power spectrum of matter and galaxies, and as well as a few other statistics, and compare, to be able to compare that with the data, right? So to have something to the, the basically um, the quantity are observable that we compare theory and data at is are the statistics. So power spectrum and a few other statistics. And just to show you that we can actually measure this, this is a plot of the power spectrum measured in the BOSS galaxy survey already from a few years ago. Um, showing, you know, clearly a very solid measurement of that quantity. And the solid line is a model prediction um, that ideally, if we get to it, we'll be able to compute by the end of the lectures. Okay, so um, now let's turn to the meat of, of the stuff. So I mentioned already that uh, we have gravity on one side and the Boltzmann equations for matter on the other side. The equations of gravity are in general, the Einstein equations, of course, very complicated in general. In our case, we will use again, the fact that we're on small scales far within the horizon and uh, that actually, and dealing only with non-relativistic matter and that really simplifies the equations a lot. Um, so you don't have to worry about Einstein equations at all. The matter equations though, we do have to worry about. So again, in cosmology, we're not interested in what individual particles do. We want to describe the overall property of math, or properties of matter, right? Macroscopic properties. So, um, and we do this in a statistical sense again. So the fundamental quantity we're dealing with is the distribution function of particles in phase space, right? Um, so consider a given particle species, say um, hydrogen atoms, 
um, because we're dealing with neutral matter. Now, a given atom has a position and a momentum at a given time, and from then I can predict uh, all the shape of evolution, right? So the phase space is the complete description of, um, uh, of, of the collection of particles. And um, instead of now describing uh, 10 to the 50 particles individually, I'm going to describe them statistically via their distribution in phase space. Okay, so if I have a collection of particles here in phase space as a function of position x and momentum p in one dimension, so you can imagine these particles are sampled from some underlying distribution that's centered around this point. And now I only want to compute how this whole collection of particles, how that distribution evolves in time. Um, and it's of course going to move because the particles have momentum. So they're moving through, uh, through space. And this evolution of the distribution function is described by the Boltzmann equation. Again, the Boltzmann equation is a very complicated beast, but in our case, we'll again, can make quite a bit of simplifications. So first of all, um, um, if we just think of dark matter, we're gonna neglect all interactions, right? Dark matter is non-interacting apart from gravity. So that simplifies the equation a lot. And then for baryons, we know that baryons interact with light, right? I mean, that's how we observe structure in the universe. But um, in terms of the overall dynamics, it's a relatively small effect, uh, believe it or not. And so we'll also, for now, neglect uh, interactions of baryons. So that means uh, actually, and both of them are cold. So that means we can actually lump them together. And really that's what we do in structure formation a lot. And whenever you hear the word, oh, a cold dark matter simulation or a dark matter simulation, it really, they mean dark matter and ordinary matter together, but just neglecting um, non-gravitational interactions, okay? So we always lump together. Um, dark matter and baryons. It would be a mistake of 20% not to consider baryons. So it's not a small mistake. Great, um, so here's the equation then. Um, the equation is just the total time derivative. The total time derivative of the distribution function is equal to zero. If you had interactions, collisions, then those would appear here, okay? But we don't have those, so it's equal to zero. And then if you expand the total derivative, it's just the partial derivative plus the derivative with respect to position times the, um, the velocity basically dxi dt plus the derivative with respect to momentum and the flow, the, the velocity in the momentum directions dpi dt. Okay, and so we need expressions for, for these guys, right? And that is uh, basically in relativistic context given by the geodesic equations. Those tell us how particle positions and momenta evolve. Um, in our case, it, I mean, you can do this proper derivation of the geodesic equation. It's in the modern cosmology book in chapter three. Um, but in our case here, where we're dealing on small scales and with non-relativistic matter, it actually just comes down back down to the Newtonian equations, except for the fact that we're dealing with co-moving coordinates, okay? So the physical coordinates are scale factor A times X, right? So, the, so that's why we have factor one over A here, because it's really A dx i dt is momentum over mass. And similarly for the momentum, um, it's uh, the gravity. It's just the gravitational force that changes the momentum. That's mass times the gradient of the gravitational potential. But now this partial x i here is again with respect to co-moving coordinates. So we have a factor one over a. Okay, so that's this term. And here the first term involved the Hubble parameter that describes the fact that. In an expanding universe, peculiar motions decay. Okay, decay is one over a. 
because basically um, the observers were always phrasing velocity with respect to the background, with respect to the to the expanding space, right? Um, and so since the expanding space kind of always tends to catch up uh, with with the moving particle, uh, this effectively corresponds to a decay in the velocities. Okay, and that's this, we call it Hubble drag. It's not really a real force, it's just the fact that the universe is expanding and we're referring to that um, expanding background. Okay, now we plug those in here. Um, and of course, we need to supplement, we need an equation for this gravitational potential, right, to close the system. And that is just the Poisson equation. So what have I done here? This is the Poisson equation of Newtonian gravity, okay? The only thing I've done is first of all, I have a factor of A squared because again, these derivatives are respect to X, co-moving coordinates. And then I replaced uh, the matter density rho with omega M times the critical density, okay? So this is uh, just standard manipulation we do in cosmology. Um, so think of this as just the usual Newtonian um, Poisson equation. Uh, in our case, I mean, it really is the not not component of the Einstein equation in the subhorizon limit. Good. So we plug those in um, and we get our set of equations here. Okay. And this is the set of equations that really governs everything in structure formation and in my lectures. All we're going to do is try to solve these two equations together, the system of equations. Um, the momentum, yes, um, there was a question on the momentum. It is uh, always a bit confusing how you define velocities. Um, so it's a, because of the various factors of A, there's different ways to think of it, but yes, I think the simplest way to think of the momentum is the physical um, peculiar, the physical momentum relative to the expanding background. Okay, so it's A times dx dt. So this factor A turns, of course, dx into a physical distance. Okay, so um, it's really, um, yeah, the uh, change in the physical position um, relative to the background. Good. Um, yes. So, I mean, it's not easy to get an intuition for this complex equation, but um, we'll try to do it anyway and uh, try to understand it uh, as much as we can. And um, I just, Let's just keep in mind that this is the underlying equation that we're solving always. Good. So um, this is the equation, but we always need initial conditions, right? And in cosmology, our initial conditions are small perturbations in the early universe, always. And But what are small perturbations to the distribution function? So in general, one could assume, as we do for, for the radiation, that there's a thermal distribution with some temperature and fluctuating density, right? Now we said though that um, dark matter is cold. So I can basically take the T to zero limit. And in that case, um, essentially uh, the thermal distribution collapses to a direct delta. And then the, where's the momentum center? The, cen uh, the center, the distribution at every given point in space is centered on uh, the bulk motion of the of the dark matter. Okay, so there's basically the statement is just that there's no velocity dispersion. Now we we don't really need to use this, um, but I just want to make it clear what precisely are our initial conditions. Okay. Um, I think we're unreasonably in time. So now what's the issue with this um, system of Boltzmann and Poisson equation? 
it's actually an incredibly difficult equation to solve to the degree that no one ever tries to solve it directly um, in cosmology because it's six plus one dimensional, right? We have three dimensions of position, three dimensions of momentum and the time direction. In addition, every time we want to compute the gravitational potential, we need the density, right? And the density is an integral over the distribution function. So it's really an integral differential equation, very nasty. And we always try other approaches uh, to solve it. So in this, lecture today, uh, and I guess also tomorrow, we're just going to simplify the equations by taking moments. So that means we want to reduce um, the six plus one dimensions to just space plus time dimensions, so three plus one, four dimensions. And we want to avoid all integrals. So um, the way we do that is we multiply the equation by maybe by p and by p squared or not, and integrate over d3p. Okay, I'm not going to go through the details here. You can find it either in the book or um, I think you should be able with some background. Um, if you have some background, you should have no problem doing this yourself. So first, for any quantity, any function defined in space time, and, and sorry, not in space time, in phase space, some function a of x and p and t for think of the energy right is a function of x and p and t um, for each such function i can define an average over momentum like this the two pi cubed is uh conventional and this whole thing then is just a function of x and t right so let's do the simplest thing let's just say a is one right then I just get integral d3p fm, and that's nothing but the number density of particles, or in other words, the mass density divided by the mass. If I take my, as my function the momentum itself, pi, then um, I get the momentum density, right? Um, the momentum of each particle times the distribution function. And then I can take the ratio of this momentum density to the number density or mass density if I average m, and that defines my bulk velocity. Okay, so again, you have to distinguish in general, for a general um, statistical description, you have to distinguish between the motion of individual particles which at any given point, there could be many particles whizzing in all kinds of directions. And this uh, moment of the distribution function, which is also velocity, but the bulk velocity, right? So it's how this entire blob of matter moves, even though inside particles could be whizzing in all directions, it's um, how this whole blob moves. And of course, it really is, um, yeah, it's a function of, of x and t only, right? Because we integrate it over p. So this whole thing is only well-defined in the sense that you can average over the particles moving in different directions. So we will later encounter cases where there's actually no well-defined bulk velocity. So now the next step is to uh, take these moments of the actual Boltzmann equation that I showed a few slides before, this one, right? You multiply by by p and integrate over d3p, et cetera. And you define one more moment uh, that is given here. Uh, so by definition of the sigma, we define this moment to define this sigma on sigma m here. Um, and the result is this. Okay, so this is something you can do as a homework. It's a straightforward uh, computation that involves a few intermediate steps. So the first equation that you get from the zeroth moment of a, a Boltzmann equation says that delta m prime plus the divergence of one plus delta m times bulk velocity equals zero. This is nothing but the continuity equation phrased in maybe slightly weird um, 
uh, with slightly weird variables to your taste, but it's nothing but the continuity equation. And the second equation that you get by taking the first moment of the Boltzmann equation is this. So the equation for um, um prime. So it's um prime plus u dot grad u plus a h u plus grad psi equals zero. That's the order equation. Okay, again, maybe really weird form, but um, this, if you drop this a h term here, this is precisely the equation of a self gravitating, the other equation for a self gravitating fluid um, with this, the gravity term here. So this term here is just, again, what I mentioned earlier, the decay of peculiar velocities in an expanding universe. Okay, so that is, um, we already encountered that before. So these two systems are really kind of familiar already if you've taken, if you know about fluid, fluids, fluid mechanics. And then we supplement it again with a Poisson equation. So irrespectively of whether you know fluid equations or not, I mean, one thing we can clearly see is that um, it's a much nicer equation. We are only dealing with fields that are defined in space and time, no more momentum. And we also don't have any integrals involved. Okay, so this is clearly a huge progress. So you might wonder why is this, I mean, didn't we even need the Boltzmann equation then? Um, well, the answer is uh, yes, of course, you, the Boltzmann equation is the fundamentally correct thing. And we managed to write it in this way by neglecting higher order moments. Okay, so if you repeat this derivation on your own, you will find that there's an additional contribution from the divergence of this sigma m ij tensor, which is the velocity dispersion or anisotropic stress. And of course we could add that, but then we need an equation for sigma m and that equation would involve a third moment and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, in, in fact, what we get is an infinite hierarchy of three plus one dimensional equations, uh, so-called Helmholtz hierarchy instead of uh, the Boltzmann equation. And of course we will later, if we continue to work with this, which we'll do, we need to justify why we can neglect um, sigma ij. And we'll see that it's okay on large scales and that we can actually use the system. Good. Um, so I'm gonna basically continue doing a little bit of algebra for the remaining 10 minutes. Um, uh, it's nothing dramatic physical will be happening, okay? Um, so to make it even nicer, we can take the divergence of the Euler equation, and then we'll also separate linear and nonlinear terms. Um, and then you get for the continuity equation, delta m prime plus theta m equals minus delta m plus some quadratic coupling between the two. And for the Euler equation becomes theta m prime plus a h theta m plus Laplace psi. Again, we took a divergence, right? So the gradient psi turns into Laplace minus some second order coupling terms. Okay, uh, and so this is nicer to deal with the set of equations. Of course, it is in general not complete because a velocity can have both a divergence and a curl component. Now it turns out that for a gravitationally a fluid just evolving under gravity, um, the curl component decays in the expanding universe if it's not sourced, something you can also show as homework. And so basically what we're gonna assume is if there was ever a source of the curl component, it was very early on in the early universe sometime and it has long since decayed. So we really don't have to worry about the curl component. So in cosmology, this is very typical in cosmology. Um, you have an equation, you find decaying modes and you immediately neglect them because the universe has expanded for a long time. And so the decaying modes are essentially gone. Good, so now comes a key step. So we're going to um, assume that all perturbations, which means the density, fractional density perturbation, 
the velocity divergence and the gravitational potential are small. And if there's really small, then we can neglect even the quadratic terms here and keep all the linear order terms, right? And that really makes our life a lot easier because now we have a set of three coupled linear equations. They're partial differential equations, but um, they're actually not, right? Because you can see that Laplace Psi, I can plug in this equation immediately and have delta m here. And so then I have all the time derivatives to deal with. So I'm really dealing with a set of ordinary differential equations, which can, one can really solve straightforwardly. So it really makes our life a lot easier if we do linear theory. And this is the result. Um, one single second order ordinary differential equation for the density field. Delta double prime plus AH delta prime is three halves omega m delta. Uh, hold on, there's probably an AH squared missing here. Yeah, AH quantity squared should be here, right? Dimensionally, this is two time derivatives, conformal time, but um, this is omega m is the critical ratio of matter density, the critical density at the given time. Um, so this is dimensionless. It's between zero and one, really. Um, so there has to be, there is an AH squared missing here, which I will fix. Um, good, but the key component is now um, the density field at X, at every position X obeys the same equation. So it will just grow proportionally um, at the same rate everywhere. Or in other words, the density at all points in real or Fourier space evolves independently at linear order. So that's a very nice, um, that's a very nice uh, property. And in particular, it implies that if the density early on in the early universe was this Gaussian random field I described earlier with independent variance for each Fourier mode, then this remains valid, right? Because I'm just rescaling all the modes by the same factor. Um, so, right. Um, so what, what we then do is we write density field of time of position X in conformal time eta as some growth factor, D of eta, we call it growth factor, times some times the density field at some reference epoch. That could be in the early universe where, um, uh, where we compute uh, the evolution of the initial density field. Um, and then here, there's again, AH squared missing, um, the equation for the growth factor. Right. Uh, yes. Good. So um, yeah, I'm repeating the same wrong equation many times. Sorry about that. Um, so in the following, I will denote this specifically as delta superscript one to make sure that this is the linear order density field, right? I mean, we know that we neglected a bunch of things to get this. So there will be corrections which we need to compute. So I will derive this as um, just as delta one. But delta one is important because it, it basically is the starting point for all more uh, accurate calculations and structure formation. And now uh, you might wonder about the velocity. Fortunately, the equation for the velocity is of course also linear at this order. So we can just use the continuity equation to get the velocity divergence and it's just proportional to the density itself. Typically one introduces um, this growth rate parameter, which you will see find a lot in the literature, which is the derivative of the log growth factor with respect to log A. Good, so what does this growth factor look like? Um, first of all, it turns out that if you have, if omega m is one, okay? So if there's only matter in the universe, no dark energy, no curvature, then we can integrate this equation analytically. And it turns out that the growth factor is just proportional to the scale factor A, okay? So for a lot of the universe's history, 
the growth factor really is just proportional to A. And so in this slide, I'm showing the growth factor divided by A to make more clear how it departs from this purely matter dominated solution. And you can see here that uh, it's an interesting quantity for us cosmologists because it does depend on um, the properties of dark energy. For example, um, if I vary the overall amount of dark energy, then I get this dependence. If I change the equation of state of dark energy, it has an even more pronounced effect on the growth factor. So if we are able to measure this D of A somehow using galaxies, then we can constrain dark energy purely by the effect it has via uh, the expansion history, purely by the effect it has on, on the expansion of the universe. The faster the universe expands, the more structure formation is suppressed and um, the smaller the growth factor is. So if we combine now this growth factor with the initial conditions from the early universe, I just showed you know, this one plot of the evolution of a few modes in the uh, early universe, um, because this is not part of this lecture. But basically, if you combine those two things, you get this result, the linear matter power spectrum, right? So now I'm, I should have, should have copied the definition of the power spectrum again here, but it's just the variance of the density fluctuations in Fourier space at a fixed k. <clears throat> and uh, shown here are different redshifts. And well, what we see is the power spectrum just moves up as a function of time because all the Fourier modes evolve at the same rate in linear theory, right? So the whole power spectrum just goes up. And yeah, from redshift zero, two to redshift zero, which is today, it has grown by about an order of magnitude, the power spectrum, because it's growth factor squared. And I'm also indicating here um, where one, again, the scale where matter density perturbations become order one. So we know for sure that um, our treatment that we did so far will not work on these small scales, right? So we expect at low K, large scales, large wavelengths, um, this description to be accurate, but then on sufficiently high K, there will be corrections to this. And the corrections become larger and larger the later we go in, in time, so the lower redshift we go. And that is really the topic of the next few lectures is how we go beyond this linear order of treatment. Um, yes, and that's all I have actually. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. I, I, there's some questions on, on this uh, chat. I don't see any questions on Slack. Uh, I think there's one uh, early one, early, early one. Just one second. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I think I was not, I uh, did not introduce conformal time um, in my notations. All the others I think I defined along the way, but I did not define conformal time. So um, conformal time is just a rescale time coordinate that's useful in cosmology. Um, so it's just defined as dt by dt over a. And you can relate also to dA and to d log a um, so as you do calculations of cosmology, you'll soon become fluid in converting these back and forth all the time. Um, yeah. So here, when I use primes, it is always the road respect to eta. Right. There's one early question also. Uh, Disha is asking, why we cannot consider perturbations as Gaussian independent functions of x also, uh, or x instead of k? Yeah, very good point. So, right. So if you think of, um, it comes down to where these fluctuations come from originally. Okay, so I think uh, Valerie should, will describe that in her lectures. Um, but basically these, the initial fluctuations that are the source of all structure 
came from quantum fluctuations during inflation. And if you think about the vacuum fluctuations of harmonic oscillators, right, they are um, independent. If you have a set of harmonic oscillators, they are independent in momentum space, not in real space. Because in the end, it comes down to the fact that the kinetic term is uh, non-local in real space, right? It's a gradient of phi squared. And whereas, um, as a, so the kinetic energy or the kinetic term in the Lagrangian, whereas in Fourier space, it's just um, K times, times phi. So um, that's in the end where it comes from. Okay. And uh, Renier is asking, why you don't consider also radiation density as source of gravitational potential psi? So, okay, yeah, guess. very good. So this is just, um, let's see, I did not, uh, no, I don't have a, so basically um, radiation, the energy density of radiation decays at scale factor to, my, uh, to the fourth power, inverse fourth power. Whereas that in matters, it scales as one over A cubed. So that means the energy density in radiation drops off very quickly compared to, to matter. And so af after about redshift 100 or several hundred, it's completely negligible. It's just a tiny fraction of the energy density. So we can actually ignore it. So then, so Fatima is asking, but delta of x and t equation must be dependent on delta of y and t, another point, because whenever delta f x t decreases or changes, it must be compensated by some uh, changes in another point. I guess this has to do with the locality of the equation. Uh, yes, y is the equation local. Um, yeah, it's a... It's a nice way to phrase the, the question. So, um, yeah, you can really think, let's see, where is it? Maybe here, although all this equation is wrong. I'm really uh, sorry about that. Um, right, so, um, so basically the thing is you can imagine uh, if you're on really large scales, right? Then every region over density and under density evolves independently because you know there's just not enough matter can't move doesn't move that far to exchange between over dense and under dense regions so on small scales absolutely yes so stuff moves from one location to another and then the density grows there and shrinks there but here you can really think of um basically um um you can think of uh, a region just uh, basically yeah how um, yeah so it's basically um, the the fact that this evolution is not local is not comes in at higher orders only um, But regarding the where stuff has to come from, keep in mind that the density perturbation, we define it as a perturbation to the background, right? So the, if you average, average it over the whole universe, its mean is zero, right? So you can think of a sine curve if you want, right? It's, it's mean is zero, it's positive at some point, negative at some point by construction, right? Because it's mean is zero. So now the linear evolution uh, it basically just amplifies the sine curve, right? So even though there's no matter moving from the low under dense region to the over dense region, the whole thing, you know, do you just multiply that sine curve by a constant? So the density contrast grows independently at each location, but still overall mass is conserved, of course. So the overall mean remains zero. I hope this is, this answers the question. If not, we can continue the discussion in the Q&A session. So there are actually two more questions. They're really good, but I think we should leave for the discussion sessions and then take a break. So please, Reggie and Ademir, can you please ask your questions during the Q&A session to start the discussions?
that we that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, so let's thank uh, Fabian for this very nice lecture. So the uh, set of lectures will be available uh, soon. Uh, I forgot to mention that we are recording this, and of course uh, uh, the recordings will also be available uh, at the web page. So thank you very much, Fabian, and I see you at the Q and A session. Um, okay. Afternoon. Time. Yes. And see everyone there. Yeah, have a break now until uh, 11.30, so um, 20 minutes for people.